So you said the, uh, the grading system, some are slightly lower in quality than the others. And it does make a difference. How much of a difference are we talking about? Um, there's a really good chart that I can find for you that kind of talks about the difference in success rates uh, based on the grades of the embryos. It, again, it's not significant to an extent. Whenever you get into poor quality embryos, there is a lower success rate and those embryos are not recommended for the first choice for transfer. Mm -hmm. So if you have a couple of embryos that are um, AA or AB or BA, um, clinics will often transfer the AA embryo first because it does have a slightly higher success rate. But at the end of the day, it's only a few percentages higher than maybe that AB or BA grade. Again, when you get into the lower quality embryos, then that can be, become a significant difference. Um, but overall, dealing with average or above average quality embryos gives a pretty similar success rate. Once you determine that you and the doctor determine that it's a good quality embryo and it should be transferred, you transfer it to the patient and that's this is when it can or cannot work. Right. So we do the embryo transfer and then unfortunately from there, it's just a, a matter of waiting until mm. the first blood test. Mm. And that blood test is called a beta HCG. It measures the level of the hormone um, human chorionic gonadotropin inside of the blood. So it takes about nine days or so to get a detectable reading in the blood, um, at least one that's significant enough to conclude if you uh, if implantation has occurred or not. Yeah. Uh, so it's we don't know right away whether or not the transfer works. We have to wait until we get that blood test for a definitive answer. And after this? Uh, so there are a couple of options for what we can do with embryos that are what we call suitable for transfer. Mm -hmm. And suitable for transfer means that they're embryos that the lab feels confident transferring either um, that day or in the future. Yeah. So in, in a normal IVF cycle, we expect about 50% of the, embry the uh, embryos that show certain signs of fertilization to be uh, usable blastocysts. So again, if you have 10 embryos that uh, eggs that fertilize properly, then on average, you expect about five of those to become blastocysts, meaning they are suitable for transfer. Um, but that doesn't take into account if they're genetically normal or not. So um, if we're only if we're not taking that into account and say that we have a cycle where we're trans one embryo and freezing anything else, then, you know, maybe you expect to have one embryo that's suitable for transfer, and then maybe you're able to freeze four embryos after that. Um, so again, that's on average, that differs for, for everyone. Some have more, some have less. Um, but what we do with the embryos are we can either do the fresh transfer or we can freeze those embryos. And what we do when we freeze the embryos is we um, put them into a media that actually takes the water out of the embryo cells and it actually uh, coats the cells with something called a cryoprotectant. And that protects those cells while they're frozen because then the embryos are placed into liquid nitrogen. And when they're in liquid nitrogen, all of their cellular activity is halted, meaning that they don't show any development the entire time they're in liquid nitrogen. And they can be in liquid nitrogen indefinitely Definitely. We've seen embryos that have come, um, we've seen babies that have come from embryos that have been frozen for 20 plus years. So, which is amazing. So that's one option. Um, and embryos that are frozen can ultimately be thawed for transfer at a later date, if that's something that people would like to do. Um, another option that people have is to um, discard the embryos and some clinics will allow you to donate them to research or you can donate them to another couple in some situations mm -hmm. and uh, those are just disposition options if say you have multiple embryos that are frozen but you're done building your family and you want to know what to do with those remaining embryos um, there are some options for what you can do for them now, every country might be a little bit different. I don't know about the laws in all of the countries for um, those embryos, but I know at least in the United States, those are some options that we do have available. Mm -hmm. um, and so whenever we thaw embryos, so say that you have embryos frozen and you want to come in at a later time for an embryo transfer, mm -hmm. 
that's called a frozen embryo transfer. And we um, take the embryo that is to be transferred and we thaw. So we place it into a media that helps to slowly bring water back into the cells of the embryo and it helps to safely warm it so that the, um, the embryo survives the warming process. And then we place it into our culture medium. So the um, media inside of the incubator that the embryos uh, develop in, we'll place it into a dish that contains that media until it's time for the transfer. Mm -hmm. And we normally thaw an embryo about two hours, if not more, prior to the transfer to make sure that the embryo survives the thaw. <coughs> sorry, and that it's expanding before um, the time of thaw. So some studies have found that um, it's important that embryos expand after they're thawed because the water begins to re-enter the cells. Uh, and that's usually a good sign for embryos that are being transferred after they're thawed. So um, the first option is to do a fresh transfer. The second option is to freeze the, any embryos that look good, you know, on day five. And then the third option is pre-implantation genetic testing. And that is where we use a laser to actually take about five cells from an embryo. Mm -hmm. And we send those five cells to a genetic testing company, but the embryo gets frozen at the lab just as if it would if it weren't tested. So it's the same thing with the cryoprotectin and putting it into liquid nitrogen. And what the genetic testing company does is it analyzes the DNA and the sample of cells that's sent for each embryo, and it can determine a couple of different things, um, depending on the type of PGT that you're having performed. Mm -hmm. The most common is called PGTA, and that's PGT uh, for aneuploidy, to make sure that the embryo has, uh, that its cells have the right number of chromosomes. So any cell in uh, an embryo should have have 23 pairs of chromosomes, one pair from the sperm and one pair from the egg. Mm -hmm. So it's a total of 46. But what can happen sometimes is uh, the cells in the embryo do not have the right number of chromosomes. Mm -hmm. And depending on how, what percentage of cells in that embryo have the wrong amount of DNA can determine if that embryo is euploid or genetically normal um, or aneuploid or genetically abnormal. And embryos that are deemed aneuploid are not recommended for transfer because they have a very high percentage of cells with the wrong amount of DNA in them. And those embryos are, they have a very high chance of not implanting or of miscarrying or of resulting in pregnancy complications or birth defects or um, affects uh, uh, conditions later in life for the offspring. So typically, Aneuploid embryos are not recommended for transfer, mm -hmm. but there are some embryos that have um, a very low amount of cells with the wrong amount of DNA, and those embryos are called euploid, and they are recommended for transfer. Um, many PGT companies have a scale that they use, so it's a percentage scale from 1 to 100, mm -hmm. and um, a lot of them say that 0 to 20 percent normal cells means that the embryo is considered abnormal because 20% or less of the cells in the sample have the right amount of DNA. So 80% or more have the wrong amount of DNA. Those are the embryos that are deemed um, aneuploid or abnormal. On the other end of the spectrum, if you have 80% or more of the cells with the correct amount of DNA, then that embryo is deemed euploid. And those embryos are recommended for transfer because they have higher um, success rates. And then in the middle of that are embryos called mosaic embryos. And that means that anywhere from 20 to 80% of the cells in the sample have the right amount of DNA. And there's also a scale for mosaic embryos. There's something called low mosaic, meaning that there's more normal than abnormal cells, but not enough normal cells to be considered euploid or normal. Okay. And then there's also high mosaic embryos, and that means that they have more abnormal cells than they do normal cells, um, but not enough abnormal cells to be considered aneuploid or abnormal. And so there's a little bit of debate right now about what to do with mosaic embryos, because some studies have found that the low mosaic embryos or the embryos that have more normal cells but are not normal can actually result in healthy live births. So there's some debate about what to do with mosaic embryos, especially low mosaic embryos. Um, I always recommend if you have a mosaic embryo, just meeting with a genetic counselor who can give you good information about uh, the chances of success with that embryo and can give you their professional opinion about what to do with that embryo to help you make an informed decision about what to do with it. Mm -hmm. So I have a question. Mm -hmm. You mentioned about the thawing process, right, of frozen mm -hmm. embryo. 
before an embryo is uh, frozen, is it dehydrated or is it frozen just like that? Uh, during the freezing process, which can take anywhere from about six to 12 minutes, give or take, <coughs> that's when that dehydration occurs. So that when the embryo is placed in liquid nitrogen, the water has been removed from it. And what do you think of uh, thawing of frozen eggs and then, you know, using it and then refreezing it again? Is, does the success rate diminish or is the success rate the same? Uh, I haven't personally noticed decreased success rates. Um, one thing I will say about thawing eggs is just to keep in mind that unlike embryos, eggs are only one cell. Yes. So when embryos are frozen and thawed, there are some cells that can be damaged in the process, mm -hmm. but most of the cells are fine. And so uh, it doesn't really affect the embryo, but eggs are only one cell. And so they're much more fragile because there's a higher chance of one cell being damaged than 150 cells for an embryo. Right. So um, you, you can expect, um, there to be some eggs that don't survive the thawing process. I mean, of course, we try not to let that happen, but they are one cell and it can happen. But no, if embryos develop from eggs. those, then I personally have not noticed any decreased success rate. Mm -hmm.